Coming up on FRC Recap, Abby Diddy is here to talk about KOP drive mods and maybe a little bit of debate going on as well uh, to what could be a superior drive chassis. Uh, of course, more sad news coming up in the FRC community as a Hall of Fame team loses a legend. Uh, new film featuring Dean Kamen is premiering, and you can actually get it for free. We'll tell you more about that. Uh, we'll discuss uh, if there's potential for a professional robotics league, and we'll wrap up with more Take From Fun Trivia FRC Edition. All this and more coming up on FRC Recap. Giving you a voice. Making it loud our own way. Welcome, Welcome to, to the fun. fun. First updates now, FRC is produced in partnership with the Blue Alliance. Keep up to date on all live and archive first robotics events and team stats at thebluealliance.com. And also, viewers like you. We need your help to keep fun loud, live, and independent. Help us by visiting our Patreon to pledge your support at patreon.com forward slash first updates now. You can also support fun live on Twitch for a few bucks a month or by linking your Prime account for free and clicking subscribe. Welcome to FRC Recap, where you're going to get the latest going on in first robotics competition and in the community. Reporting for First Updates Now, I'm Tyler Olds. And I'm Nick Jr. And today here on FRC Recap, uh, our guest is Abby. Uh, you might have seen him previously as he was a host slash judge for the Inspire uh, North Carolina FRC CAT event that Fun held this past week. How's it going, Abby? Thanks for joining us. It's going good. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so lots to talk about here. Let's jump right into our headlines. Uh, starting on our headlines, unfortunately, we have to do so on a little bit of a somber uh, note coming in. And it, it feels bad because this has now been, I think, the third show that we've started out in this uh, factor. But we do want to report out on this that uh, uh, Brandon Paget, a longtime mentor, drive coach, Woody Flowers finalist award recipient on Team 16 Bomb Squad, has unfortunately passed away. Uh, some thoughts that we've received about Brandon, I want, do want to read these off because uh, for those of you who have been in the first community for a long time, there's a good chance that you've met Brandon before, uh, of course, as a 16 drive coach and somebody who's been in the program for 20 plus years uh, as well, too. So do do want to read us some things, but I'm actually going to play uh, somebody sent us uh, a video that his wife posted in the background. Uh, that I think is, is really cool. It just kind of shows his character a little bit on here. And he's doing, uh, I don't know what the proper term for this. It's some sort of water skiing. I'm sure somebody, I don't know, Nick or Abby, if you know what this is, but it looks amazing and badass. So let's read a little bit about this as this is going on in the background here. So uh, Brandon began his, began his Baxter uh, healthcare engineering career at the 1999 First Robotics Regional at the Kennedy Space Center. His first week at work led him to be assigned the Team 16, and he has been an integral part of the team since. He became the design leader in 2003 and drive coach in 2008, including 16's championship win in 2012. Uh, Brandon was the ultimate optimist, but he was also pragmatic. Brandon's voice can be heard at the end of the 2011 documentary that followed 842, uh, who uh, they were at 16's alliance partner that year. And after losing to a mini bot penalty, uh, for those of you who watched this video and, and were around, then you probably have heard this. But at the end of the uh, video, he says, we're done, boys. Uh, so Brandon was heavily involved in the groundbreaking development uh, in medical device and pharmaceutical company industry for Baxter uh, during his time and dedication to Team 16. Uh, as mentioned, showing the screen, uh, just some, some cool stuff, just showing his character. And this was a guy who had a lot of fun in life. So we really uh, want to recognize him for that. But uh, a few more things to uh, speak about on here. Uh, he is survived by his wife and three children. Um, you can view uh, his obituary. I know 16 has posted something about him, um, and it is out there as well. Um, so Brandon's kids are all under 16 and have been on the team the, their entire lives. And for those who had parents that are on the team, you know what I'm talking about for this. So uh, according to 16's social media page, uh, this is what they said. Uh, Brandon's passion and drive inspired us to push ourselves and understand the value of hard work that contributes to success. Uh, so whether uh, that success be on and off the field, he could always count on we could always count on Brandon to bring a smile to our faces. Uh, Brandon was also heavily involved in FLO and FTC. He was an FLO coach and FTC judge for many years. So uh, our hearts go out uh, to those on 16 and past and present, those who have known Brandon for a long time, and of course his family and, and three children that he leaves behind. It, um, a life taken too soon, quite unfortunately. Uh, and, and you can read more if you if you want to get more into. 
uh, what happened with that stuff. Uh, but I, I just want to say uh, in general, uh, I, I know I had a chance to meet Brandon a, a couple times, only in brief passing, but you know, I knew I th- of him as a 16 coach for uh, a long time. So Brandon, you will be missed and thank you for your contributions to the community. Uh, and those once again, who knew him for so long, like Meredith Novak posting in chat right now, who I know was uh, close to him. Uh, we, we feel free Meredith and uh, uh, we hope that um, whatever comfort it can be there for you can be at this time. Yeah, absolutely. And I know uh, before I move on to the next one, um, I know that a lot of stuff that, um, you know, a couple of people that I've I've been in first for probably you know, six or seven years now. And a lot of people that um, a lot of stuff that I learned from people have referenced um, some stuff that Brandon had done. So mm. um, that's why I put that, you know, hashtag thank you, Brandon, in there in chat. So oh, there you go. Very um, nice. Yeah. Kind of moving on, on to our next headline. How um, should it go? You know, new chief post uh, happened this week about mentoring remotely. Um, you know, I think that this this is frankly going to be a common issue amongst us all teams. And, you know, hopefully that uh, we have some better news come January and hopefully we're able to meet in some sort of capacity. But, you know, unfortunately, I, I think that the majority of the first community can agree that um, unless we see a vaccine, you know, in the next couple months here and even then uh, we frankly um, are going to have issues with meeting um, in large groups. So um, a few ideas have been brought up, um, you know, such as solid professor to teach CAD. Um, and one that I really like is the current workshops that are going on with 971 Spartan Robotics. Um, I think that it's a very generous uh, of them to offer to publicize these yeah. and, you know, uh, that the first community could really use this as a reference point for virtual teachings. And if you don't necessarily, you know, maybe you're, you're only a second or third year team or maybe you're a complete veteran team. Um, I think that uh, referencing to those workshops for very detailed points on specific uh, operations of the team and could be very necessary for your team. So, and then obviously, uh, you know, moving forward, not obviously, but moving forward, we will also be discussing this headline and let's discuss that uh, after Abby's. Yeah, so um, something that uh, is pretty new is there's, an int- there's a really interesting film featuring inventors and leaders, including the founder first, Dean Kamen, and it's currently available for a free screening through Monday. According to the website, dreamerdocumentary.com, Dreamer is a film for anyone who's been told f- phrases like stop dreaming, get your head of the you know, out of the clouds, be more realistic. And this tells the story of ordinary people who became extraordinary by following their dreams. You can check it out at dreamerdocumentary.com. Yeah, I just want to mention on this too, if you get an opportunity, it's uh, I signed up for it uh, and you'll get sent the link. There's uh, six days left if you want uh, to get the free screening. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I, I we had a couple people ask if we could broadcast this on fun. Uh, I'll reach out, I'm gonna guess not, just because of uh, how rights work for that. Uh, but if we can, we will, so just a heads up for that. All right, uh, moving on. So uh, those of you might have seen uh, posted in a bunch of places, uh, almost to the point of spam, but a uh, new FLO table has been made available uh, out there, which is quite interesting. It's made out of corrugated plastic uh, that you can pick up. And if you're, uh, if you're active in the FLO uh, community, like so many of us are, uh, might want to check this out. It's quite interesting. It's $130, by the way, not a sponsor hashtag. Um, but we do want to talk about it because it is quite interesting here. Uh, it's a table topper, by the way, which actually I really like because it's it's uh, light, uh, uh, light and easy. It's made out of four millimeter corrugated plastic on there, uh, and it's made by uh, Geyer uh, Instructional Products. Uh, and we haven't seen too much in reviews, but I, do, I did read one uh, that I saw posted on a on a group site. Uh, so a few things. Uh, first thoughts are uh, lightweight, easy uh, to put, assemble. Uh, unfold and put the walls together with Velcro and the walls, uh, unfortunately don't seem to be sturdy enough, uh, for wall or lineman, uh, and going to test, uh, how it sees, uh, under how, how it, uh, excuse me, we're going to test, see how under how it would, uh, support at a higher level. Uh, so the website claims that while it suggests a solid surface below the topper that they, uh, recommend an overhang no more than 12 inches to ensure stability of the, uh, table to support, uh, an FLO robot. So, uh, so Nick, uh, Abby, I don't know if you're, uh, how involved you are with FLO, but it, it, are you guys involved in FLO? Would this be something you'd be interested in trying? Uh, yeah, really quick. So I am, um, my position, you know, at the school that I work with is kind of, uh, mainly, you know, it's, I, my technically title is first robotics, but I do a lot. Um, you know, I try and help out the FLO when I can. And frankly, they meet in a cafeteria. So the lunch tables and that kind of thing, the hardest issue is getting those flipping tables in there, man. So if we had the table topper and set that on, you know, one of those nice long lunch table, um, it would be, you know, super easy for us at least. And I've actually sent this to a couple of mentors um, thinking about using it. So thank you to uh, Gary uh, Instructional Products yeah. for doing that. Abby, are you involved with FLL at all? 
Yeah, so um, our team actually doesn't do that much FLL outreach just because our the infrastructure in our area is more geared towards the VEX programs. Sure. So those are the programs we work with mostly, but we have worked with independent FLL teams in the past a lot. So for example, um, I guess last year we actually, we were working out of a Microsoft conference room at the time because we were still um, trying to find a space for our first season. And at that time, we like in the conference room right next to us, there was an FLL team that was struggling to get a robot together. And I feel like this type of thing would be super helpful for them just Mm -hmm. because they also don't have that sort of permanent workspace where they can actually do this type of thing, like set up a full wood table. So I think this sort of um, very easy to set up and portable table would be extremely helpful for teams in that situation where they don't have that permanent meeting space, but can set something up really quickly on like another surface. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Uh, so kind of moving on here, um, Tyler is the one that actually kind of brought this up, and uh, frankly, I know nothing about it, but reading into it, I, my entire programming team has set, seen it now, and uh, I frankly just think it's pretty interesting. So um, kind of moving on here, um, you know, this is a topic that not a ton of people might not know about, but I guarantee you a good chunk of the FRC community is involved in it. So um, what, what's happening here is if your team has published a public repository on GitHub, um, you know, you're, you're a part of this. GitHub has created an Arctic vault uh, that will be essentially storing the, the world's open source, open source uh, software for, you know, the next thousand years. Um, any repository that was public or open source on GitHub before February 2nd, 2020 will be stored in the GitHub Arctic vault. Um, and I'm kind of going to read a link here that's directly from the website so you guys can get a kind of get a gist on what this is. But the GitHub Arctic Code Vault is a data repository preserved in the Arctic World Archive, a very long-term archival facility 250 meters deep in the permafrost of an Arctic mountain. Holy crap. <laughs> the archive <laughs> is located in a decommissioned coal mine in the Svalbard, forgive my... Uh, pronunciation but archipelago uh closer to the north pole than the arctic circle yeah it's uh, really far capture... north by the way if you yeah, haven't seen it's it it's really far it's yeah. really far north uh github will capture a snapshot of every active public repository on february 2nd and preserve that data in the arctic code vault so i'm gonna drop a link in chat real quick and uh so you guys can kind of you know if you have a uh an interest in reading up on this but i re- I spent an hour at work today reading on this while I was on the clock because it was so interesting. So, um, you know, if you guys take the time, look into it. But, I mean, I know my team uses GitHub. I know majority of FRC teams use GitHub to, you know, organize their programs. And if you have some public repos from previous years that you have released to the FRC community, there's a good chance that you're part of this. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. So, I'll be moving on. All right, so yeah, on a more serious note, um, there have been a lot of um, recent events and stories about um, the need for more equitable and accessible environments in FIRST programs. And so to in response to this, several members of the community have made an Equity First initiative to provide resources and advocate for a better future for the program. They have a petition to mandate ED and I training for all FIRST volunteers and have a Discord server to advocate for changes and provide resources for people who like somebody who's leading a program who might not know where to go these um the server is an amazing resource i've been on it for a week or so and it's definitely really helpful as far as resources go and um yeah you can learn more at equityfirst.card.co all right, let's uh, wind up here. Uh, interesting topic that's been thrown around in uh, one incarnation or another. We've seen this over the years, but uh, a little bit more serious discussion. Some good stuff going on in Chief Delphi this past week, by the way. Uh, so, and that's been the existence of a professional robotics league, uh, or the you know non-existence of it. One of the two things. Uh, with that, but let's talk about that a little bit. So, uh, so starting out, let's give some credit uh, uh, to Robo One Four Seven asking about uh, professional robotics league. If it could be something that's actually viable, and then Eric Klein posted a uh, a poll on here uh, saying uh, the direct question is: Would you be interested in a pro robotics league, or would you not be interested in a pro robotics league? And uh, I actually put the no, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit as well. Uh, and, and Nick, I don't know if you responded to this. Uh, 
uh, yourself, but uh, yeah, I also put no. Oh, really? <laughs> Interesting. Okay, yep. so uh, so something I guess we'll, we'll talk about on this is uh, uh, there are a couple examples out there. One of them being, if you haven't seen, is a Robo Master uh, competition. Uh, that takes place in China, uh, and uh, they actually uh, send over a couple of U.S. commentators uh, each time to to help try to translate this, even though none of the text is. But for those of you uh, esports people out there, uh, this is essentially a MOBA, uh, and the way that they're controlling these robots is actually through a screen. So they're doing it FPV on here. They're not actually watching the robots as they're controlling the field. So if you look in the lower right, you can actually see what, what they're seeing as they're moving on the field, and that's what their HUD looks like. Uh, so these are about the size of FTC robots, and you uh, notice them using mechanic wheels uh, as well, too. So a lot of similarities uh, to what it is. Um, but like I said, we'll talk about this more and let's discuss that. But, you know, there is something out there, and really the question is going to be, can there be more? So, chat, we'd love to hear from you uh, as we get into our list to discuss that in just a little bit. Let us know what you think. Could there be a professional robotics league uh, to scale uh, more specifically in uh, areas that first uh, tends to be more involved in, though there is some involvement in China? Love to hear what you say uh, on that, and we'll read that off in just a little bit. Uh, so with that said, that's going to wrap up our headlines. Let's discuss, or let's jump into, let's discuss that. Right through the wall. All right, Nick, what we got first up on the agenda? Yeah, so I'm going to kind of break down uh, one of the topics that I brought up earlier um, during, uh, you know, the headlines. And that's kind of, you know, the uh, the fact of virtually and remotely teaching. So uh, I know, at least for my team and um, a lot of Michigan teams with, um, you know, FTC coming up, uh, this fall, and I know Michigan does it differently. So, uh, majority of you know Michigan FTC happens you know between that September to December range, um, where most of the uh, world tends to go um, you know on the other half of the season. And uh, I think that you know I, I know legitimately at least on you know the thoughts of uh, you know my program or whatnot, uh, we're legitimately thinking on how. You know, we are able going to be how we are going to be able to manage um, trying to have an FTC team. And, mm. you know, we're trying to evaluate the ways because usually right now is when we're looking at um, starting to train those members. And hopefully, you know, we, we were actually, you know, one thing that we've really struggled with in our middle school program is that uh, we get a lot of new kids. Last year, we had 45 kids that want to sign up. So we ran two FTC teams last year and. Um, you know, not everybody showed up. So for the people, for the people that are going to say you can only have 15 members per team, you know, we only did at 15. But well, and next, um, something I mentioned real quick too is that you are in Michigan, uh, and Michigan specifically has FTC in the middle school programs and FRC in high school. So correct, a little bit yeah, different than yep, what some absolutely. some other areas might experience with that too. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks for pointing that out, Tyler. But uh, so usually we were actually planning on, you know, we always have an issue where we ended up spending a couple more weeks on training more than we would like to. Um, you know, we get behind schedule and whatnot. So we were going to plan on, you know, bringing them in at the beginning of July and spending, you know, maybe once or twice a week and just training those basic things and, um, you know, the things that many uh, students may not have and the returners that would, you know, be picking up on quickly and just getting ahead of the game. And frankly, with, you know, coronavirus and everything going on, um, I know Michigan was one of the really bad states at first and we've kind of mellowed out, but, um, you know, we're starting to pick back up and unfortunately it's not at a good time um, with school trying to start and that kind of thing. So uh, it, it's going to be difficult and we've kind of evaluated ways. So, you know, one big thing that uh, my middle school team and my middle school FTC team and our high school team is really going to focus on is having our captains host Zoom calls. Um, and, you know, so like my mechanical captain would host one for anybody that would be interested in learning mechanical and trying to do training that way. And I think the easiest way, at least from my perspective, is that a lot of students are going to learn more, at least in my perspective, if the student is teaching it. Um, and sure. only because my the main thing for me is that if I go to teach, you know, a student, you know, they, they're going to grab something, right? But ultimately, if I'm talking to a new student who's not part of my program, who doesn't really know me, they're going, I mean, there's the level of intimidation there. And, you know, they might be nervous and what kind of, and that kind of thing and are going to be, you know, n nervous and don't want to mess up. So they might, you know, not pick up on certain things where if the student is teaching it. So if I have a, you know, a junior or cedar student captain that they might be familiar with in school, they might have a past with them and, you know, might know them from earlier. Thank you, Connor, for the uh, sub, by the way. And, uh, it, you know, I think, and at least in my experience, it, 
the student will get more out of it if the student's teaching it. So I mean, Nick, I thought I figured that's why we called you Nick Junior was to try to ease that tension a little bit uh, between <laughs> there. So uh, Avi, how about how about you guys on on your team? Do you mind talking about a little bit of your dynamic, how you're looking at welcoming in uh, new students uh, for the next season, and how you might be training these students as well? Yeah, absolutely. So our team is um, well, we're a rather small community team, only about thirty kids, and um, we've only got. Actually, we've only got one really involved mentor, and he's a saint. Um, but like God that does him. present some <laughs> like unique challenges for us in the sense that we don't have mentors who can do a lot of technical training. But that also does give us like so we've been doing a lot of student to student teaching. But also, I think, and this is definitely a less popular opinion, but I think this quarantine has actually given us a really really great opportunity for training. Because, um, well, our team, we've been doing, for example, we've redesigned our robot, um, or we're in the process of it. And in addition, we're also working on actually, I'd say, like, well, one thing is we're working on, we've been doing design competitions. So, for example, things like the Robots to the Rescue competition hosted by PTC, sure. um, different multiple catathons m members of our team have participated in, and also individual design projects. So, like, for example, every kid on our design team has, like, been doing individual projects just to improve their own skills and in addition just like even with other fields like even with more hands-on fields we've been starting up meetings for those as well so like um, for example for mechanical we had a meeting yesterday where we were talking about like um, the plans not yesterday sorry um, a couple of days ago and we were talking about the plans for the off season, how we'd actually run tools training and just running everyone through that and um, for electrical, for example, we're doing at-home soldering projects. And the big thing is that students have a lot more time now since they're not actually going places and being forced to do things because of school and whatnot. So, sure. for example, like, I'd say, I guess, like, giving the example of our two new design kids this year, um, David and Alan, they're um, one's an eighth grader. And normally, like, new kids don't get to do that much on design, right? Because, on, like, in the time constraints of a build season, you're obviously going to give more of the work to the more experienced kids because, obviously, competitive performance is big, and newer members don't usually get that opportunity to do things until their junior or senior year of high school. But um, because of this quarantine, like, these kids who... These newer members, they didn't get to do much CAD work in season, but um, since then they've been working on individual subsystems of our off-season robot, as well as... Um, Actually, again, those design contests I mentioned have been really great. And in general, it's just been really, it's been a really great opportunity to give people projects. And since they now have the time to do it and time to learn in a stress-free setting, we've actually found that quarantine is working out pretty well for that because like, um, even with our new members, so we had our, in, we had a virtual info, informational meeting um, day before yesterday. And ever since then, we've just been sort of, um, like getting our new members onboarded and um we're going to be starting out like virtual zoom training classes and stuff like that um, which will hopefully be able to actually we'll give them projects and since like normally we don't have the time but since we have the time this year i i could see our newer members getting really good really fast just because yeah. they have the ability to work on like very high level projects and start from the ground up and make the mistakes that they need to make without the worry of like build season or like um, school on top of that. And so, yeah, I've just felt like, right. yeah, this has been pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, moving forward, Tyler with the uh, Professional Robotics League. Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit uh, and a little bit more uh, on this. Uh, once again, the topic being, uh, could there be a Professional Robotics League? Uh, out there and could that exist so the the uh, opportunity the what has been put out there essentially uh, so I was wondering uh, what's typed in there is is I'm wondering how many of you would be interested in professional robotics league uh, something with organized teams uh, attached to city uh, ie like the LA Lakers a professional robotics sport uh, that we can all follow that doesn't change from year to year but played with uh, FRC style robots and controlled by humans so uh, so here's my take on this um, there's a couple of things originally when I read this I was thinking more of like, you know, FRC, like this is targeting FRC mentors for things. And for what my love is in first, I don't think something like first fits into what that is. I know that's not a hundred percent 
what you know the the thing was on there but uh, i see all these like frc mentors just licking their chops like oh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go make, <laughs> make myself a uh you know a professional robot i'm gonna be part of that league right away well one thing should have wouldn't and already built a damn battle bot if that was your plan uh second annie mark uh shout out to nick lawrence since he's in stream right now uh has uh has uh Wait, man. <laughs> yeah, so Nick Lawrence, uh, they have the uh, Robot Fighting League that they have. Uh, he's going to grill me because I don't remember the exact name of it off the top of my head. But uh, Fight Night, Andy Mark Fight Night on there. Uh, so those are opportunities. You can already do stuff like that. But uh, looking at things like could there be something like an Overwatch uh, that is comparable to this? Yeah, I think it's possible. But what are you going to find that's going to last a duration of what something like that is, right? So when you look at like even like the the robo master saying most of those last five to ten minutes or something like that can you build an entire event consistently like that in a professional sports area where it is that short duration now i'll point to esports and i'll wrap up here on my end esports has matches that is very quick and short like that through different maps so I think the closest comparison is going to be something like that and not to something like a professional uh, sport like, you know, football, soccer, basketball, baseball, hockey, that sort of thing like that. Uh, I just don't see something like that really being fully viable. And more importantly to me, uh, the the spirit and ethos of first is to try to change the culture. And to me, yes, that could be done at a professional level, and I think that might help take it over the top. But I'd rather focus right now on developing the youth into the future. That's my personal take on it. Nick, how about you? Yeah, so believe it or not, Tyler, uh, good minds think alike. So I, I'm pretty much on the same topic with you. And the main thing for me is that, you know, if if the professional robotics league wanted to happen and be like baseball or hockey or football, I think that we would have to start with the game not changing anymore. And in my opinion, what makes first badass is the fact that the game changes every year. That you got to build a new robot every year, with the exception of 2021, because you know, thank you, Corona. Sure. But um, in my opinion, I, I almost get more out of it. And I know, you know, I'm a mentor and whatnot now. But when I was a student, I almost got more out of it that the fact that I knew between January and the middle of February, I was trying to create a design challenge and trying to solve this problem, you know? And I think that in order for us, in order for something like FIRST, not necessarily us, but in order for FIRST to move, you know, something like FIRST to move into a professional robotic setting, one, the game's gotta stop changing, and two, the game that is decided has to be extremely simple. And, you know, Nick Lawrence in chat uh, put that in also, but it's gotta be able to be simple. And for it to get the traction of a professional sport, you know, like people can watch basketball, know what's happening within 10 seconds. People can watch hockey and know what's happening within 10 I seconds. I mean, I don't know what the hell's happening in cricket and that's popular. Well, fair, fair. But, um, you know, like Nick Lawrence said, it's got to be easily digestible within 10 to 15 seconds. And I think that really hits the nose on it for me. One real quick thing I want to follow up with before we bring Abby on for this. Um, somebody mentioned, you know, just BattleBots. To me, I'm sorry, BattleBots is freaking boring at this point. Like, there's some cool stuff and there's some they cool hits. The yeah, but but there's just, like, at some point, it's, it's a bunch of fans what? holding cheesy signs with semi-decent production. I love the announcers. Yeah, like I think the announcers are pretty good, and I get that. Um, but like with just the two robots clashing each other, there's matches where nothing happens for five minutes, and that mm-hmm. to me is boring as hell. Um, you know, I want to I want to see high flying action for that stuff, and um, mm-hmm. yeah. So, Adi, uh, what are your thoughts? Could could there be a professional league developed out of something somewhere, and how could it be? I could see professional robotics happening, like RoboMaster, for example. It seems to be doing pretty well for a program of its like age, I guess. But the biggest constraint is, like Nick said, the game would have to become sta- static because um, obviously audiences, yeah. I suppose you could do something with the changing game and that would definitely be really interesting to see. However, um, I would see that say that um, they would have to make sure the audience is all aware of the game. And then in addition to that, um, the way sports works, you've got player, you've got like, I guess, a bunch of different robots aren't going to change. They aren't going to... Like, sure, you could keep making modifications to robot, but the, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you're not going to have, like, robots retire after they get older and a new generation of robots comes in. As much, if the, as much as you'll see, like, hyper-iterated machines, 
And so what I think will end up happening in a professional league, if there was only one game, is teams with their infrastructure set up such that they've essentially got, they're just pushing the robots to the point of the most optimized at this point. And I could see that like becoming sort of, I guess it would end up um, where the same exact team wins every year. And um, I mean, like in professional, in professional sports, you don't really see that because teams will trade players and all of that stuff definitely happens. Whereas here, like you just see the same engineering being optimized to the point of like, it's just dominant. So let me, let me just throw a counterpoint out there and I'm going to contradict myself a little bit and maybe just play a little bit of devil's advocate on this is uh, you look at something like the Overwatch League, right? The characters in Overwatch League, other than adding characters, don't change, right? When a player plays, you know, one character and a player plays, you know, two people are playing Winston, it's Winston, right? Like that, mm-hmm. that character doesn't change. What what changes is the individuals. And I think that's where Overwatch League has seen success is they don't focus on the, the characters in game. They focus on the, the individual players for things. And right. that's where I think if you were to scale something like this, um, keep all the robot like in, in XRC when we've uh, had streams for that uh, for the longest time it was just one robot and it was all the same and I actually love that because all the robots yeah. were the same level playing field and all that came down to was driver skill and I thought that was really cool uh, that that's the only differentiator between all of them, that and if you have a potato internet but other than that uh, you know that's yeah, that's, that's what it came down though. to so I, I think if we're gonna do anything like that. That, that's a possibility is that you focus on the people, uh, not maybe on the engineering uh, for which it, for many of us who are very much so ingrained in what first is uh, might not be as appealing. But I think from a broader audience, that's how we might find it um, somehow. All right. So just um, a small counterpoint to that, I guess. Yeah. But um, I can see like the thing with robotics is that you can automate so much. Like, um, for example, in RoboMasters, I know a lot of RoboMasters teams at least do a lot with automation, with advanced controls. And whereas in, um, I guess, in professional Overwatch, for example, you can't exactly, like, have a macro to go um, shoot and, like, just, I guess, I mean, aimbot, technically speaking. But, like, um, I guess the idea is, in general, um, you can't actually automate to the degree you can in robotics. So I feel like that would definitely sort of eliminate that human differentiator, but we'd have to see in person. Yeah, uh, you know, obviously I think that's a good point to what Tyler had to say. So um, kind of moving on, we're going to go ahead and get into the guest discussion now. So, um, you know, when uh, Avi approached fun and one, you know, mentioned that, you know, it would be kind of cool to have, uh, you know, us talk about the, you know, the kid of parts and that kind of thing on an FRC recap. And we were able to get him on. So, um, you know, like I said, the guest topic that Avi's chosen is the discussion on the kid of parts chassis, um, otherwise known as the KOP, as it's referenced in the first community. Um you know, so specifically a few things on why you would m- maybe use this chassis over a custom one. Um, what do you think that the benefits are about it and that kind of thing? So, um, Avi, if you kind of want to go ahead and just kind of explain on uh, what your kind of overall thoughts are on the kit of parts chassis and uh, how uh, can it be used in certain things possibly over a custom one? So, in my opinion, I think the kit of parts chassis is a fantastic resource for teams, especially teams who are limited by manufacturing or design horsepower, where, like, sure, a top-level team will have the de- really rapid turnaround manufacturing as well as the ability for their designers to do a custom drivetrain with really, with, I guess, a lot of ease. But in my opinion, the kit of parts chassis is really useful for teams who don't have that energy or manufacturing horsepower to devote to a custom drivetrain or troubleshooting a custom drivetrain. And if you want something that just works, I, I personally feel the chassis is like the last thing you should be optimizing on the robot. Like you should have all of the other functionality before you start optimizing that chassis, you know, doing the variable drop centers and all of that stuff. And I personally think like the kit of parts chassis is sort of like, I, I guess it's sort of like a platform for teams to store, sort of refine their mechanism building capabilities before they can I guess, before they have the resources and ability to do that custom chassis easily. Yeah, you know, I I think that's a good point. And, um, you know, frankly, my team, um, 4130 at least, we used, obviously, the kit of parts chassis from 2012 um, all the way up into 2015 and didn't really um, experiment with any sort of custom until... Um, you know, we got cheese fries and a giant sliding door that was chopping people's fingers off um, in 2016 with Stronghold. So, um, 
you know, we didn't really evaluate any of the custom thing. And Abby, on, on that note, I will agree with you that um, for those low resource teams who may not have a ton of technical mentorship or technical experience with their students, um, the kit of parts chassis is a great way to start. And frankly, it's a really easy way just to get the ball rolling. Um, you know, I, I know like teams like me this year, we spent, oh God, probably almost a quarter of build season just on our chassis because it is, I mean, it's the foundation of your robot. If the chassis don't work, nothing on top of the chassis is worth it because you ain't moving anywhere. Right. So um, I think that the kit of parts chassis allows for maybe some of those teams who um, you know, may not have the design power to just get the extra step and say, you know, hey, we know this works. We can put it together, put this code in it and move on from there. Um, but a kind of counterpoint of that, too. And uh, one team I'm going to mention is uh, 1720. They are an outstanding team in Indiana who is consistently using the kit of parts chassis. And, it, you know, it could be an evaluation of time at that point, too. Like I stated earlier, they may just... And, you know, I'd have to ask um, somebody from Ryan, you know, maybe Ryan Doganox or I probably butchered that last name. Donio, but yep. Donio, yeah, I knew I did. But, um, and, you know, he, he might be able to throw some more insight. I'm not sure if he's watching tonight. But, um, you know, in my opinion, if we were, you know, if we get thrown some game that I have absolutely no idea and we really have to spend the time on the mechanisms – I would just take the kit of parts chassis and say, look, I know this works. Let's move on and focus on what we really have to do to be able to play the game. So um, you know, on the note of the kit of parts chassis, the Thrifty Bot also has gearbox plates that you can upgrade uh, the kit of parts chassis to use three motors. And I know 1720 uses those. Speaking about Ryan Donio. <laughs> so, yeah, Ryan Donio. Um, so my apologies before, for butchering your last name. Yeah, no, no before we moving forward uh, – uh, Abby, I'd love to have you talk about, we, we have some pictures that you sent us, uh, both from your, your post on Delphi and a few extra others. I'm going to put them up on screen. Do you mind just kind of walking through a bit more of like kind of uh, what it is? And, uh, you know, for those like me who have no clue what this picture is, like, what is this? And what what is the modification that you've made? What advantages have you seen out of it? All right. So my objective when I was working on these kit of parts chassis modifications or over the off season was... Um, just to make the because we actually did struggle using the kit of parts chassis at champs last year um we were in our pits we had to rebuild a lot of our robot because we had been working on a major mechanism to iterate because of the bag because and so we had to like i guess rebuild that at champs and while doing that we also had to um replace a belt on our chassis because um while actually adding a mechanism at our first event um someone accidentally drilled through one of our belts and we did not notice that until champs and i mean that's obviously a very very user error type of thing but i think like um what we noticed from there was it was really hard to swap wheels and um i guess swap belts on the stock kit of parts chassis at least in the configuration we use just because of the spacers and um, so the biggest modification we did was actually um, one fixing the bumper mounting because of the because I guess the bumper kit that comes, it's very, it's solid, but there's definitely a lot of room to improve. So what you're seeing on screen right now is actually, um, uh, we're using weld nuts from McMaster, and we've actually got those bolted on, and they've got the actual nut floating inside of that housing, which means it's, which means you don't have the issues that you have with a lot of nuts where you've got to get it perfectly aligned, because the nut will actually align to the bolt. So hmm. even if you have small issues those bumpers are going on no matter what um if you've got like an angle bracket or something on top attached to your bumpers and um in addition uh, i'd say the biggest modification we made that we found was really helpful was actually using a tube axle for the wheels so essentially instead of putting our, our spacers directly on the bolt um what we did was you can do this with either snap rings as are shown in the picture or just spacers on that tube but the idea is just have an axle that has a bore in it for the bolt going through and then put your spacers or snap rings or whatever shaft collars also work um and on top of that and what what that allows you to do is when you're dropping out a corner wheel um you can just unscrew and then drop out the entire thing instead of having to pull off each spacer individually and then when putting it back in you don't have to line up each spacer when you're actually um i guess 
when you're actually trying to get that back together. And we found that super helpful combined with the nuts. I know Andy Mark had a prototype version of this on 3940's robot, I believe. But um, we've actually used those same weld nuts on the inside of the inner plate um, to actually capture our axle bolts. So what that allowed us to do was not have to reach inside the chassis, um, especially reach through all of our superstructure stuff, which was absolutely key this year because our superstructure blocked off most of our access to our um, most of our access to those nuts. So by having those fixed in place, you don't have to actually reach in there, fiddle with stuff, and um, Swapping wheels definitely becomes a lot more painless. And in addition, you can act, and the be, one of the benefits of tube axle aside from that is you can actually tighten that bolt out. You can tighten that bolt down a lot, which helps with by preloading your chassis and just making it more robust to impacts. So, yeah, absolutely. Oh, go ahead, Tyler. I was going to say, we did have a couple of questions in chat that I wanted to grab up. We do have to be kind of quick as we're running a little bit behind uh, on these, but uh, from uh, uh, Avahada3. Uh, says, what's your favorite modification for the KOP chassis uh, that you wish more teams would do? I'd say the tube axles, 100%. If we had done that our rookie year, we would have saved, I believe it was 30 minutes at Champs, we spent just trying to get our spacers aligned correctly. And I think like that's probably the most valuable modification. And it's got high production costs if you're doing it off the shelf, but any team can really just take some 3 8 inner diameter, 1 half inch outer diameter tube stock and just cut it to size and use it. Sure. Yeah, Avi, mean, believe it or not, on that point, um, in 2015 and 2012, I want to say, the only mod that we made to the kit of parts chassis was the tube axle. Yeah. So I've actually I've actually used that, you know, not the exact same thing, but um, very similar to what you have there. So it's a great idea. Yeah, and then we'll take the second question uh, from Nick Lawrence, uh, came in here, uh, said, I'm curious as to why make custom wheels versus using a COTS wheel? That's a great question. Um, actually, these are off-the-shelf performance wheels from Andy Mark. So um, we would ne we don't have the resources to do custom wheels, but the performance wheels are absolutely great. Um, the replaceable tread means we don't have to throw out a wheel anytime we actually wear down th tread. And it's just, in general, a an amazing wheel, highly recommend. Also, a bit more traction on blue nitrile than um, high grip, so that's something. And the metal construction is definitely more robust to impacts than, say, the polycarbonate construction of high grips. So less likelihood of shattering on the burn. Nick, have you have you guys done custom wheels? So I've actually I, I've designed one custom wheel. I'm not the greatest in CAD, but I'm getting better. But I know two teams now that have done custom wheels with 3D printed TPU tread. Um, and, you know, really specifically 3357, the comments from uh, Michigan have yeah, done it specifically the past two years. But um, I think it just, I mean, it all comes down to, you know, will the off the, will the off the shelf wheel work? Yes. But will the custom wheel give you the extra design configuration that you might be looking for? Um, you might be looking for more wheel slippage. You might be looking for more traction. Um, and I think you can do some creative things with printing the tread. Um, frankly, I'm not, uh, the, the performance wheel from Andy Mark that they sell now, the aluminum ones, um, I'm obsessed with, I wanted to use them this year. I got outvoted, 100%. but, um, I really like, and especially the fact that you can buy in like a four foot stick and cut your own links to it. I love that. Um, but I think you can, you can just do some creative things with printing the tread and um, everybody, you know, the, specifically the comments that I've talked to have seen great things from printing TPU. Um, and I know a few other teams that are trying it too. So, uh, yeah, okay, I guess that's kind of where I'm at with that one. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to stick on this for a couple more minutes. Uh, and then we'll, uh, if we have time, we'll get the trivia. We'll see. If you're interested in playing trivia, uh, shoot first updates now a message. If you're watching live, shoot us a message in. Uh, uh, chat here, uh, private message with your phone number. Uh, and then uh, if we do end up playing trivia, we'll give you a call uh, for that. So I'm not sure if we'll have time, but just prefacing that ahead of time. So uh, so looking, uh, I want to get back now to the, the chassis itself. Uh, I think in many cases, there's, there's always going to be the answer of it depends, right? But like when you look at the KOP chassis versus maybe a modded KOP chassis versus a full custom KOP chassis, I guess at what level does, is it like a level of capability you have to be at in order to do a full custom chassis? Or is it like, uh, hey, like there's no reason to do it. Like, I guess, is there a reason to do a, a custom uh, chassis? I know my old team 2026 
uh, they cut out their own custom chassis out of box tubing every year, uh, and they swear by it, and they, they love using it every single year. So I don't know if what you guys have experienced or seen, uh, it, but does something like that really offer any sort of advantage over the uh, KOP chassis, Nick? So I guess the biggest thing for me is what really made us the made us make the move, and um, you know, in 2016 is the layer of defenses and the ground clearance with the kit of parts chassis just wasn't going to cut it, frankly. So, um, well, you know, we said I guess we'll experiment, and you know, just for just to throw it out there for anybody that um, has known, you know, maybe 4130 if you're from FIM or whatnot. We have never fully catted the robot until 2019. So in 2016, we had no CAD, nothing. We were completely like, sure, let's use this Harbor Freight drill press with a 16th inch walk on it and make something happen. So uh, I think, you know, the, the step that really takes you to making that custom chassis is, you know, does the space by using a custom chassis really allow you to do something more? And you know, specifically this year, um, you know, with the 2020 robot and my team. And I think with the kit of parts chassis, frankly, just wouldn't have worked with our, you know, with our index that we had designed this year. And what mainly comes down to it is just the space between the center wheels, um, you know, with the gearboxes that come off of, you know, whether you're using the thrifty bot gearbox or you're using uh, the tough boxes, I think is what the uh andy mark kit of parts jesse comes with now abby you can correct me on that if i'm wrong yeah, but tough boxes. okay so um you know in, in order for us to you know have what we wanted to design we had to run a flipped custom gearbox so we were in a custom chassis and a custom gearbox this year and frankly i think it just comes down to a design constraint and does building that custom chassis really give you that extra edge or that extra space that you really need. Um, you know, and, and another perfect example is in 2019, my team also built a custom chassis. And we had to have a custom chassis because the space between our center to center wheels, you know, between, yeah, between the center wheels had to be super wide because we were dead set on building one of the, a four bar climber that came out of the bottom of the robot. So mainly I think, at least in my opinion, it's a space constraint. Um, obviously if you want to do swerve, um, I don't think that works with the Andy Mark kit of parts chassis. So you're probably going to have to make a custom one at that point. Um, but I, I, and at least in my experience, the main thing it comes down to is just a size constraint. So that, that's next year, by the way, Andy Mark will come out with the uh, KLP chassis that's designed for swerve. Right, Nick? Uh, yes, Lawrence in chat. Please. So, now I'm sure Nick says yes in chat. We'll speak for him. Come on, that's, Nick, that's get it going, man. Uh, Abby, how about you? Any final thoughts uh, on that in regards to, uh, you know, what, what levels you should be looking at, or is it just a personal choice between uh, a custom chassis and a KOP one? I think it really comes down to, I guess, personal choice to an extent, but also like at the end of the day, if you're, um, I guess once you're limited by the kit of parts chassis and it's actually, you're cramming so much functionality into your robot, robot that you actually need to make those changes to actually, um, well, one, the kit of parts chassis is really configurable, so you can configure the length and width pretty well. But um, at the end of the day, if you're packaging your, if it's, well, if it's easier for you to do a, um, a custom chassis, like you've already designed and built one, you have the experience troubleshooting it, and if it's easier for you to do than doing the kit of parts chassis, then I think it's worth it. But um, until then, you're not getting any more functionality of a, out of a custom chassis than you are out of the kit of parts, unless you're going swerve, which of course is an entirely different discussion. But in general, it's got the same exact tank drive functionality. It's just a matter of is designing a custom chassis around your mechanisms going to be easier for you? Especially since like most teams design the same West Coast drive every year with just a slightly different length and width, right? Like same solution for bumper mounting, similar gearboxes, yeah. tensioners versus center to center, same bearing blocks. And so I think at the point where it becomes easier, and I got this advice from someone, I actually, no, I don't remember who I got it from. I know it was a, anyway, so, um, the advice was if you if it takes a designer on your team less than a day to do then it's worth it because at that point it's not a limiting constraint because one day in build season isn't that much compared to like a week or two weeks so if you're able to get that chassis done in a day mostly designed and manufactured in like another day or so then i think it's um definitely worth going for but if you're constrained to not i guess if you're constrained by manufacturing or design or what have you I think the kit of parts chassis, like 
your chassis should be the last thing you touch, um, like on your robot, especially since you want something that just works. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, I think that's a great point personally. So good well, job with that. One thing I'm just going to wrap up with before uh, before we, we head out, and we are running a little bit short on time, so we're going to be wrapping up here in just a minute, uh, is – uh, I think the one thing that maybe a KOP chassis might take away from are teams who really do want to do everything from scratch and learn from that. Uh, you know, once again, if you get a, something that's, you know, a box of parts and put it together, that experience might be a little bit different than trying to come up with something from scratch. Now, you might completely fail and fall on your face, but that's okay sometimes. And, uh, you know, you could still, you know, CAD from scratch, like the KOP chassis or something like that. But, uh, you know, I, I have heard that as an opposition before, like, well, we might lose on that experience. That's kind of the, the thing you hear about any of those uh, COTS mechanisms, right? Like like the the grates and stuff like that that are out there. Yeah, it's like, the oh, they're, they're giving you the whole thing kind of right thing. away um, that you might lose out. And, and I don't necessarily agree with, with that, uh, but I understand the point uh, about that uh, as well, too. So it'll be interesting to see um, as, you know, what options are out there and what it can keep going on here. Go ahead, uh, Abby. All right. So as a counter to that, I personally feel you're going to get a lot more learning and development from actually iterating and refining those higher level, like superstructure mechanisms more and getting the, and optimizing those as opposed to designing essentially just a clone of um, say like just the, the one West coast drive frame you saw in chief Delphi. Cause I don't think there's a lot of innovation going on with West coast drives. Like, I personally, if we ran a West Coast drive, it would be the same exact one every year just because, like, most teams who do it already have one and they're familiar with it. So it's essentially just an exercise in manufacturing at that point and changing one or two dimensions in CAD. So I personally feel like you're going to get a lot more, um, I guess, like, for example, if you're 2019, if you're making the trade-off between having a custom drive and having a climber, like, I know there are several teams in my area, at least, who did make that trade-off, and I feel like if you have to make that sort of trade-off, I feel like you're going to learn more out of designing a new unique mechanism or iterating that mechanism to the point where it's actually very functional and capable of performing at those high levels yeah. as opposed to actually just um, essentially just building a clone of the Versa chassis example on the VEX Pro website. Yeah, totally agree with that. And uh, it's a great point to make, Abby. do appreciate that as well. So that's going to wrap it up for us here today on First Updates Now. Uh, Abby, thank you so much once again for coming on and, and having these great discussions with us, talking a bit more, of course, about the KOP uh, drive chassis and some of the cool modifications you made for that. Uh, where can people find more about uh, you or your team or anything else out there? All right, so our team actually has multiple domain names because um, we actually bought a couple of different people bought different domain domain names okay i believe um for our team sushi squad.org should be the latest version of our website sure. and in addition i've got a couple of posts on chief delphi like the kit of parts on steroids one that i've been um, working on and i'll probably publish with more updates but yeah we also have an instagram at uh sushi squad 7461 and um yeah that's where people can find more about our team i guess and uh, Nick Jr., always a pleasure to have you on. What's going on uh, with you during the summer with either you or your team right now? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm kind of just, you know, hanging out, you know, in Michigan <laughs> with uh, cases, unfortunately, rising here. So I'm um, just trying. We just did our captain's interview, socially distanced, obviously, uh, this past Saturday. So kind of moving forward that. Got a big uh, golf outing. We're trying to really hit home with our team this weekend. And you know, um, we're averaging, you know, we're, we're probably going to bring in about 10% of our usual budget um, this coming season. So I'm um, trying to make a good chunk of that at this golf fighting this weekend and, um, you know, just working my tail off uh, with uh, an internship I'm doing. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. So if you're in the Michigan area, check out the golf outing, huh? Yeah. Message me. I need four foursomes for Saturday. <laughs> so if you know anybody that golfs, feel free. I mean, uh, Nick Lawrence is saying it's uh, not that far away from Indiana. Can always I don't know the Canadians golf. I don't know. So, all right. Uh, so with that said, thank you so much uh, for coming on uh, once again. Uh, don't forget you can check us out in our Discord, Discord.gg forward slash First Updates Now on social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. Uh, all that fun stuff under First Updates Now. We also do have an FTC uh, uh, Instagram and uh, uh, Facebook account as well, as well as we do have an FTC show tomorrow. Please come check it out at 8 p.m. Eastern if you're watching live on Wednesday. Uh, that takes place every other Wednesday. FRC Recap, of course, will be back next week, Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Every week you can check us out here live on Twitch or, of course, under podcasts under First Updates Now or on YouTube. 
under first updates now. Uh, so thank you, everybody who helped support the stream. Quick shout outs, because I always keep forgetting to do that. Uh, Mac1817 with a prime sub. Uh, Nick giving away a, 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 a tier one sub. Uh, Red Leader342 coming in with uh, five gifted subs. Thanks so much for that. Connor coming in, tier two sub, man. Great to have you back on 38 months and Richard 4707. Thank you everybody helping fun stay loud, live and independent. We need your support, especially during these times. We got just a couple bucks to give. We would definitely appreciate it through a prime sub or on our Patreon, or we will be having YouTube join soon. We just got verified for YouTube partnership. Uh, so you'll be able to contribute through YouTube join as well too. We appreciate that. Uh, with that said, uh, we'll see you next time on first updates. Now talk to you then. Good night, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. Thanks to all of our co-executive producers on Patreon and Tier 2 Plus subscribers on Twitch keeping fun loud, live, and independent.